Hello and welcome to today's topic. Today's topic is cholesteatoma. Now we will discuss it. So what is cholesteatoma? Cholesteatoma is the presence of keratinized squamous epithelium in the middle ear or mastoid cavity. It can be said that it is skin in the wrong place because the middle ear and mastoid cavity is lined by pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and skin is keratinized squamous epithelium. So when skin or keratinized squamous epithelium is present in the middle ear, it is a wrong one. If uh, we define cholesteatoma more formally, then we can say that it is a mass formed by stratified squamous epithelium in the middle ear or mastoid subepithelial connective tissue formed by progressive accumulation of keratin debris and uh, may be associated with surrounding inflammatory reaction. Actually, the term cholesteatoma is a misnomer because it neither contains cholesterol and nor it is a tumor because the suffix oma implies tumor but here it is not a tumor so cholesteatoma term is a misnomer it has uh, other two synonym that is epidermosis or keratoma now what are the parts of a cholesteatoma cholesteatoma has two parts number one is the matrix of a stratified squamous epithelium which lies on a fibrous limb and uh, there is keratin debris. Now come to the pathogenesis of cholesteatoma formation. Uh, the reason for which a stratified squamous epithelium grows in the middle ear which is uh, actually lined by pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. There are a number of theories. Number one is that it can be congenitally present. Number two is the retraction pocket theory. Retraction pocket theory is the most commonly accepted theory. According to this theory, there is abnormality of the eustachian tube function which causes dysregulation of the middle ear pressure. As a result, there is a creation of a negative pressure in the middle ear for which the tympanic membrane becomes retracted inwards. And uh, this retracted tympanic membrane can no longer self-clean laterally. So there is progressive accumulation of keratin debris and cholesterol formation. Number three is the epithelial invasion or immigration theory, also known as Haberman theory. According to this theory, the stratified squamous epithelium from the external auditory canal or outer tympanic membrane moves into the middle ear through a pre-existing perforation. Number four is the basal cell hyperplasia theory, also known as papillary ingrowth theory or Rudy's theory. According to this theory, the basal cell of the germinal layer of the skin undergo hyperplasia due to chronic infection. And number five is the metaplasia theory or sadist theory. According to, according to this theory, the middle ear can undergo metaplasia into the squamous epithelium under certain conditions like chronic infection. The cholesteatoma has a special characteristics that it can expand and destroy the surrounding structure. Why this occurs? Because it secretes uh, some enzymes like catalase, acid phosphatase and proteolytic enzymes. These enzymes are released from the osteoclast and mononuclear inflammatory cells that are associated with cholesteatoma. By expressing these enzymes, it can invade the surrounding tissue destroy the surrounding bones like the ear ossicles, most commonly the long process of the incus. It may destroy the bony labyrinth. It may destroy the facial canal. It may destroy the tegment tympani and cause serious complication. Now the classification of cholesteatoma. The cholesteatoma can be classified into congenital and acquired. The acquired cholesteatoma can be primary acquired cholesteatoma and secondary acquired cholesteatoma. The primary acquired cholesteatoma is the most common form the acquired cholesteatoma is called primary when there is no pre-existing perforation and the acquired cholesteatoma is called secondary when and the cholesteatoma grows after a pre-existing perforation. Now diagnosis of the cholesteatoma. Diagnosis of cholesteatoma in adult is quite straightforward. There will be a history of ear discharge which is foul smelling and on examination we will find that there is tempering membrane perforation or there is tympanic membrane retraction with uh, characteristic keratin debris. But diagnosis of cholesteatoma is not so straightforward in children because the congenital cholesteatoma 
can present as a white mass behind the intact tympanic membrane and uh, this may give the impression that there is a medullary effusion and the congenital cholesteatoma can cause uh, conductive hearing loss which is similar to otitis media with effusion again when only one ear of child is affected then the conductive hearing loss is not so severe until the later ages uh, so diagnosis is delayed here sometimes diagnosis can be made only when the cholesteatoma uh, becomes infected and ruptures through the membrane then after suctioning the uh, pus dry mopping the ear and uh, examination with the uh, autoendoscope we can confirm that it is cholesteatoma sometimes congenital cholesteatoma needs to be um, iringotomed in the anterior inferior position to confirm uh, whether it is congenital cholesteatoma or otitis media with effusion so diagnosis of cholesteatoma in children may require and several visits to an otolaryngologist now what investigations we can do to evaluate a cholesteatoma number one is the ct scan ct scan reveal the extent of cholesteatoma whether there is an erosion erosion of the ossicle erosion of the facial canal erosion of the dural plate it can also show the pneumatization of the mastoid the height of the tegment tympani and the position of the sigmoid sinus these findings help the surgeon to plan the operation and to anticipate the possible complications that may arise during surgery number two is the mri it shows better soft tissue delineation and it is more useful when there is a dural plate rupture and ct scan to evaluate the intracranial cholesteatoma extension and other intracranial complication but its use in the p operative workup is limited it is uh, more greatly used in the post operative follow up of the patient to see whether there is any residual cholesteatoma or recurrent cholesteatoma number 3 is the audiometry audiometry shows conductive hearing loss if there is any sensory neural hearing loss the surgeon may be aware of the possible labyrinthine fistula although the sensory neural hearing loss may occur due to chronic infection and inflammatory reaction so what is the treatment of cholesteatoma treatment of cholesteatoma is the surgical removal of the cholesteatoma the surgery for cholesteatoma has uh, two types of uh, role the primary role of the surgery is uh, to remove all the cholesteatoma to prevent further destruction and complication to give a dry and watertight ear to give a ear that is self cleaning and to prevent the recurrence of cholesteatoma and the secondary role is the hearing improvement but it is only possible after primary role has been achieved so during counseling of a patient for surgery he should be counseled about the primary and the secondary role of the surgery and also that there is a chance of recurrence of cholesteatoma of the surgery the surgical approach is of two types the canal wall up approach and the canal wall down approach in the canal wall up approach the posterior superior metal wall between the external auditory canal and the mastoid cavity is kept intact and in canal wall down it is removed canal wall up procedure is preferred in case of uh, children canal wall up procedure has uh, different options tympanotomy or tympanoplastic surgery adicotomy with or without reconstruction combined approach tympanoplasty in some patients surgery may not be done like uh, children with uh, heart disease or some other comorbidities in this group of patients the treatment is uh, regular microsuction and steroid antibiotic ear drop so what is the prognosis after surgery cholesteatoma has a high rate of recurrent and residual disease the residual cholesteatoma is the uh, stratified squamous epithelium that the surgeon uh, have failed to clear all and the recurrent cholesteatoma is the new cholesteatoma formation either through the invagination of the newly constructed tympanic membrane or through a weak part of the reconstructed tympanic membrane and there is a term called recidivism it implies both residual cholesteatoma and recurrent cholesteatoma this together is called recidivism 
and the chance of residual and recurrent cholesteatoma after five years is 40 uh, percent pediatric age group has uh, more chance of recurrence because uh, after surgery in case of adult population the middle ear and the eustachian tube function uh, improves but in the child age group after surgery due to immaturity of the eustachian tube the middle ear function cannot be so improved so the chance of residual and recurrent cholesteatoma is more in pediatric cholesteatoma surgery so we have to follow up the patient after surgery regularly maybe annually for 10 years to observe any residual or recurrent cholesteatoma formation we are almost at the end of our discussion in the end i will point out the difference between the adult and pediatric cholesteatoma pediatric cholesteatoma is associated with the more inflammatory response it extends more rapidly it is more aggressive in nature than the adult cholesteatoma but uh, adult cholesteatoma uh, has the more propensity to involve the petrous apex and the pediatric cholesteatoma has the more propensity to destroy the ossicle of the middle ear and the pediatric cholesteatoma is uh, more associated with residual and recurrent cholesteatoma and pediatric cholesteatoma may be associated with eustachian tube dysfunction and the otitis media with effusion that's all i have today from the cholesteatoma thanks for watching see you later goodbye